At its height in the second century, the Roman Empire was a juggernaut. It had all land surrounding the Mediterranean in a stranglehold. A century earlier, Augustus had broken the mighty Egyptian Empire. Rome was a purring military and administrative machine. Yet it wasn't a single event that brought Rome crashing down. Centuries of internal hemorrhaging combined with a great migration of Germanic warriors would spell doom for the empire. In its shattered remains, a fractured landscape of city-states battled it out for European supremacy. Welcome back to Nutty History. Today we're exploring the battle for Europe after and during the fall of Rome. By 410 AD, the Roman Empire was already split in half. After years of threats from Germanic tribes in the northwest, Emperor Diocletian decided to divide his empire into east and west. The decision was built upon by his successor, Constantine, who named Constantinople, now modern-day Istanbul, as the capital of the east. By 395, the Roman Empire was officially split into the Western Empire and the Eastern Empire. The decision proved disastrous, for the Western Empire at least. The Eastern Empire thrived, but high taxes in the West, coupled with a plethora of domestic problems that we'll get into later, led to a sharp decline, a decline that opened up the fabled capital of Rome to attack. In 410, Rome wasn't even the capital of the Western Empire anymore. Ravenna was. Such was the tattered state of the empire when the Visigoths arrived at the doorstep of the once great former capital of the most powerful empire on the planet. The Visigoths were a Germanic tribe that had migrated southeast from Scandinavia a few centuries earlier. They had been tormenting Rome for years across its northern territories. By 390, the Visigoths had set up shop in the Balkan regions of Moesia, on the edges of the Eastern Roman Empire. On and off war with the Eastern Empire had led to an uneasy peace by 395. But when Alaric I rose to power to unite his people and declare himself the first king of the Visigoths, Rome was in trouble. Alaric actually served in the Roman army under Emperor Theodosius as the empire was splintering into two halves, and he helped defeat the Franks in the west. In fact, he was a Roman citizen and had achieved a great deal in battle, earning the top military ranking called Magister Militum. Yet his exploits on the battlefield were ignored in Rome, and he was unhappy. What's more, the Romans had been treating the Goths like third-class citizens for years, despite the help they were giving them on the battlefield, and their gradual assimilation into Roman society. Years of starvation, high taxes, exploitation, and discrimination led Alaric and the Visigoths to march towards Rome, pillaging much of Greece along the way. When the Roman Emperor Theodosius died in 395, he officially split the Roman Empire between his two young sons, Honorius and Arcadius. They were inexperienced and naive, and power struggles and mismanagement created a window for Alaric to march his newly unified Gothic armies westward into Italy. Alaric and the Visigoths then lay siege to Rome, three times. Rome was the most populous city in the world, with almost a million inhabitants at the time. But administrative chaos and a military that was riddled with mismanagement made the task far easier. The successive sieges between 408 and 410 had left the city's inhabitants desperate, starving, and broken. By the end of the third siege, Roman Salarian Gate was simply open for the Visigoths to walk through. Some say this was done through an act of treachery. Others say Rome citizens simply gave up, too hungry and too tired to put up any more of a fight. Whatever the reason, Rome was ransacked. The Visigoths looted nearly all the city's coffers, taking off with an astounding amount of wealth. But instead of staying in the city, the Visigoths left, headed north toward Gaul. Alaric would die just months after, but the Visigoths would remain a powerful force in Europe for years, as we shall see. Rome, however, was left in shambles. Its population fell by nearly half in the ensuing years. Plagued by economic failure, and social disarray. It was the beginning of the end. Well, maybe it wasn't quite the beginning of the end. There were warning signs hundreds of years in the making that hinted at the Germanic threat to Rome. Sometime in the second century BC, Scandinavian tribes from the Jutland in what's now Denmark began moving south into Roman-controlled territory. 
The tribes of the Sembrai and the Teutons created alliances with other nomadic groups in the area and set their sights on the Roman Empire, moving west across modern-day Switzerland, France, and Spain. The Cimbrian War between 113 and 101 BC saw the Romans successfully defeat the barbarian hordes to the north for the first time, but it was a long, drawn-out conflict, one that resulted in the Roman overhauling of their military, which created the professional, efficient, legionary machine that the Romans became so famous for. The dramatic threat would not go away. These fierce warrior bands were here to stay. A little more than a hundred years later, the Roman war machine was humming. The empire had ballooned under the leadership of Augustus Caesar, Rome's first emperor. In 9 AD, Augustus and his generals were looking to conquer the lands of Germania to the north. Still a loose collection of nomadic tribes, the people of Germania were more than the barbarian hordes we hear about from the Roman historians. They were a dynamic society. Their travels from the Jutland across Europe had brought them into contact with many different cultures and they exchanged goods and ideas along the way. The tribes were fiercely egalitarian and independent. Anyone could join their ranks, so long as he did his job and earned the respect of his peers. Anyone could rise through the ranks in the military and acquire leadership positions. At this point, the Romans were cocky. They probably underestimated the Germanic tribes, which had amassed a sizable army through tribal alliances. Germania extended from modern Holland to Poland in the east, and much of the land was forest. Not knowing what they were walking into, three Roman legions entered northwest Germany in 9 AD, where they were slaughtered by the Germanic tribes using guerrilla warfare-style tactics to ambush them and lay waste to their army. The Romans were shocked. Instead of controlling Germania, Rome had to retreat back to their western territories. A permanent battle line was drawn along the Rhine River for the next 400 years. The Battle of Teutoburg Forest was one of the most significant events in European history. If Rome had taken Germania, the Germanic people would have probably started speaking a Romance language. It created a boundary between Germanic and Latin cultures that lasted for the next 2,000 years. In 235, the Roman Empire nearly collapsed. Emperor Severus Alexander was assassinated by his own troops, and a power struggle ensued. 328 became known as the Year of Six Emperors, when six different people tried to claim the throne. A plague devastated the empire between 249 and 262, leading to widespread crop failures and economic turmoil. The growing influence of Germanic mercenaries in the Roman military led to a breakdown in chains of command and a general weakening of central military power as armies became increasingly independent. During this time, the Goths saw a window of opportunity. They would eventually split into the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and play a major role in the division of Europe after the Western Roman Empire fell for good. In 249, the Goths invaded the Eastern Roman Empire from modern-day Bulgaria. It became the first of eight Gothic wars between the Germanic tribes and the Romans over the next 300 years. Led by King Naiva, the Gothic armies took Philippopolis, now the Bulgarian city of Plodiv, killing the Roman Emperor Decius and his son in the Battle of Arbertus. It was the first time a Roman Emperor had been killed by the barbarian hordes. A few years later, the Goths pushed farther but were finally defeated in the Battle of Nisus in 268. It was a bloodbath for the Goths, who lost between 30,000 and 50,000 men. From about 300 to 375, the Goths and Romans began to intermingle on the northeast edge of the Roman Empire. It was during this time that the Roman army was Germanized, as Germanic warriors like Alaric began fighting as mercenaries. In Constantinople, it became fashionable to wear animal skins and furs like the Goths did, though the more conservative Romans frowned upon the new style. By the beginning of the 4th century AD, a great migration was underway. The invasion of Europe by the Huns in 375 pushed the Germanic people farther into Roman territory, igniting a series of conflicts that would contribute to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. While Alaric and the Visigoths moved on Italy, another group of Goths, known as the Ostrogoths, remained in the east. Forced into submission by the Hun, they fought alongside the Hunnic armies until the death of Attila in 453. Eventually, they merged with several other Gothic tribes, including the Thracian Goths, forming a powerful alliance. 
In 471, Theodoric the Great became the king of the Ostrogoths. Theodoric was a leader split between two worlds. Though he was Germanic, he had been raised as a diplomatic prisoner in Constantinople and had received a Roman education. In 470, he returned to his Gothic homeland, Pannonia, in modern-day Western Hungary to rule the Ostrogoths. However, he still retained close ties with the Eastern Roman Empire. In 483, Emperor Zeno made him commander of the Eastern Roman forces, but Theodoric would waver back and forth between alliances, often attacking Roman territories without Zeno's permission. Still, in 489, Zeno asked Theodoric to invade Italy. In 476, Flavius Odoacer, a soldier and statesman with a barbarian lineage, deposed the last true emperor of the Western Roman Empire, Romulus Augustulus. Zeno didn't like this and sent Theodoric and the Ostrogoths to overthrow Odoacer. With the help of Rugii and another Germanic tribe, Theodoric took Italy in 493. The Ostrogothic Kingdom, known officially as the Kingdom of Italy, was established. It would last until 553. Theodoric was a tolerant ruler. He supported the freedom of religion while also recognizing the authority of the Pope in Rome. His reign saw Italy turn into a prosperous nation, and Theodoric was able to successfully balance the Germanic and Roman cultures within his new kingdom. He had a wide influence as both the King of the Goths and the successor to the Western Roman Empire. It soon became clear that Theodoric was not just a puppet for Emperor Zeno and the Eastern Roman Empire, which by this point became synonymous with the Byzantine Empire. Theodoric began making moves that the empire didn't like. An alliance with the Visigothic Kingdom, which had established itself on the Iberian Peninsula of Alaric sacked Rome, was an uneasy one that led to Theodosius effectively conquering the Visigoths by allowing them to remain sovereign. Diplomatic marriages between Theodosius' family and other Germanic kingdoms in the region created alliances and began shoring up power in a way that the Byzantines didn't like. Something had to be done before this civilized barbarian amassed an army and marched on Constantinople. It turned out that the Germanic people weren't so united, though. Distinct cultures and kingdoms had emerged from the ashes of the Western Roman Empire, and everyone was fighting everyone else for regional supremacy. Two other powerful kingdoms that emerged after the fall of Rome were the Vandals and the Franks. The Vandals had originated in Poland and were pushed into Roman territory like many other Germanic peoples by the invasions of the Huns. By 435, they had moved westward, through Gaul in the Iberian Peninsula and into North Africa. There, they took the cities of Carthage and Hippo Regius from the Romans and established the Vandal Kingdom. In 455, just a few decades after King Alaric I and the Visigoths, the Vandals sacked Rome. They were more ruthless than the Visigoths, destroying the Roman aqueducts and pillaging the city for weeks. The Vandals destroyed so much that they had a new word named after them, Vandalism. By 486, another group of Germanic people were emerging as a force to be reckoned with, the Franks. Around this time, the Franks took Roman-controlled Gaul, the region around modern-day France and Belgium, and began consolidating their power. In 509, Clovis I united all the Frankish tribes to become the first king of the Franks. For the next 200 years, his dynasty would rule over the Frankish kingdom. As king of Italy, Theodoric sought to create alliances with his neighbors through marriage. His daughters were married to the Visigoth king Alaric II. His sister married the Vandal king Thrasimund, and he himself married the sister of the Frankish king Clovis I. It didn't help much, though. The Byzantine Empire forged an alliance with the Franks, and in 507, Clovis I marched into the Visigothic Kingdom and took a big chunk of its territory. In the process, the Visigoth King Alaric II was killed. The Vandals saw weakness and joined up with the Franks to fight the Ostrogoths. Years of infighting ensued between the Germanic kingdoms. In 526, Theodoric died and left a power vacuum within his kingdom. With a weakened power structure, the Byzantine Empire, led by Justinian I, invaded Italy, looking to retake Rome and unify as much of the shattered Western Roman Empire as it could. The last Gothic War was fought from 535 to 554. It was a protracted back-and-forth war that saw Italy seesaw between Byzantine and Ostrogothic control. But finally, Justinian and the Byzantine Empire were victorious. The Ostrogoths were allowed to live in Italy under Byzantine rule, and they eventually faded into obscurity. 
In 711, the Visigoths were finally defeated by the Islamic Umayyad dynasty headed by Caliph al-Walid I. For the next 300 years, what's now Spain and Portugal became al-Andalus. While the rest of Western Europe floundered in an intellectual dark age, the Muslim state of al-Andalus became a major educational hub, home to major advances in math and science. As rival kingdoms quickly weakened, the Kingdom of the Franks gradually took control of Europe. In 768, Charlemagne ascended to the throne, and by 799, his kingdom stretched across nearly all of Western Europe except for Al-Andalus. He didn't have Rome, though. Rome in the southern half of Italy was still controlled by the Byzantine Empire, and there was a growing unease in Constantinople that Charlemagne's expanded empire would threaten the east. But in 799, Pope Leo III ascended to the papacy. Unlike his predecessor, Leo immediately recognized Charlemagne as a Roman nobleman. The Romans didn't like this, and a group tried to attack Leo III and tear out his eyes and tongue. Leo escaped, but he was now jaded by Byzantine leadership. He crowned Charlemagne the first Holy Roman Emperor. Centuries of dispute would follow regarding the legitimacy of the rule between East and West, known as the Problem of Two Emperors. A tug of war between Byzantium and the Holy Roman Empire for the true title of legitimate heirs to the Romans would smolder into the 1400s, with neither side wanting to call the other Roman. Western Europe would remain fractured, however. Charlemagne never really created a kingdom that could rival what Rome once was or what Byzantium still was. When he died, his kingdom was split up between his sons. Europe would be divvied up among smaller kingdoms for the rest of its history. The medieval age had come. There would be no great empire that could ever rival what the Romans did. A big reason was due to the rise of feudalism. In the near constant state of war in Europe after the fall of Rome, kings allowed landowners to raise their own small armies. This evolved into nobles who would promise the king military service in exchange for land, land that was lived on and farmed by serfs. The system created a centralized government that prevented any major kingdom from consolidating too much power because oftentimes there was a lot of internal conflict. It was also just a bad economic system. So many serfs paying high taxes to so few lords created little to no development of infrastructure or technology. In the shell of the mighty Roman Empire, Western Europe was plunged into the Dark Ages. What was your favorite fact about the fall of Rome? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.